Okay, we're going to get started. Thanks all for uh, being here. Uh, our first event to kick off the 2015-16 academic year at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, in the spring, after the oil, first oil price collapse before it rose and has since fallen again, uh, we at the Energy Center undertook to reach out to different regional experts uh, with expertise in economic and political situations and key oil exporters, uh, also along with being energy experts, to try to assess what the impact of this sharp decline is really historic collapse relative to the other large collapses in the oil price we saw in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, what impact that would have on some of the largest oil exporters most dependent on oil revenue for their budgets. Since then, we've released studies looking at Iran uh, by Richard Nephew, a fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy, looking at Mexico by Adrian Lejeune, uh, who's also a fellow at the Center and the former CEO of Pemex. And the next in the series is the uh, study that we have released today. You'll see a presentation of it here. The study is now available on our website at Energy Policy columbia.edu, uh, and it's by Francisco Minaldi, many of you know, who's a Baker Institute Fellow in Latin American Energy Policy and Adjunct Professor of Energy Economics at uh, Rice University, also affiliated with the Belfer Center at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, as well as IESA in Caracas, Venezuela, and the founding director of uh, IESA Center on Energy and the Environment, and one of the most well-respected uh, analysts and experts and academics out there looking at uh, energy economics in Latin America, and really delighted that he was able to join us today and that he was willing to uh, produce this report for us looking at the current state of uh, production, uh, economics, uh, and, and, and the political situation in uh, Venezuela. Uh, so he's going to present uh, the results of his study, and then we're going to have a brief panel conversation up here about the study and put it in the context also of what's happening more broadly in global uh, energy markets, and I'll introduce the panelists when we all uh, stand up uh, afterwards. Uh, people may be watching uh, online, and you can participate as well, ask your questions uh, via Twitter through the hashtag CGEP, Center Global Energy Policy, CGEP events, uh, and follow us on Twitter at Columbia U Energy. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all for being here, and let me please turn it over to Professor Minaldi. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be uh, here at Columbia, uh, nice, nice room. And uh, as uh, Jason mentioned, uh, this is sort of a brief, brief paper trying to sort of uh, give an overview of what's happening in Venezuela uh, after the uh, oil price uh, uh, collapse, uh, looking at both uh, sort of the economics, uh, the politics, uh, but mostly focusing on the oil industry itself, which of course uh, is sort of the base for everything else in the, in the country. So um, let me start a little bit putting things into perspective. I mean, Venezuela received the largest windfall of any uh, country in, in Latin America during the last, uh, you know, the, the, the decade just before uh, uh, last year. And to put it in, in perspective, it was about 304% uh, of GDP in terms of the size of the economy. To give you an idea, sort of that's close to the uh, percentage that you will find in, in the countries in the GCC uh, as, as uh, a percentage of their size of their economies, which are, of course, uh, uh, larger than Venezuela, uh, I mean, at least Saudi, but, but uh, per capita larger too. Uh, but but th that gives you an idea of sort of the, the, the amazing size of, of this windfall. And that contrasts tremendously with a, a very uh, poor performance uh, in terms of uh, the economics. As you can see there, Venezuela had the, the, the slowest uh, rate of growth of uh, uh, almost any country in the region. I mean, if you put sort of the smaller countries, you will find that Haiti and a couple of uh, other Central American countries are, are, are uh, doing worse uh, than Venezuela if you, uh, in, in, if you include sort of, uh, depending on which years you include. Uh, but but uh, in some years, you, you, only Haiti, it's, you know, it's, it's doing worse than Venezuela, uh, which is uh, really, uh, you know, uh, amazing. 
in terms of inflation, of course, today, you know, we, Venezuela has the highest uh, rate of inflation in the world, but uh, even if you look at sort of the, the, the whole period, Venezuela had a, was an outlier, a significant outlier uh, in terms of inflation uh, during, this, uh, uh, during this period. And if you do a, a similar uh, comparison, but instead with the, the, with, within the region, you, you look at countries, say, in OPEC or countries that had similar levels of windfall, Venezuela's performance is even you know, uh, uh, worse in, in, in comparison. Uh, uh, and Moreover, you know, Venezuela, compared to other uh, uh, countries that are oil dependent, uh, was uh, a striking case of uh, no, sort of not learning, you know, from the previous experience. So most uh, uh, other uh, oil dependent countries uh, in this cycle, uh, in this uh, high oil price cycle, uh, uh, invested more, saved more, and, and you know, and paid the uh, uh, debt. Uh, and, and, um, uh, this was not the case of Venezuela. This is uh, sort of a, uh, I call it sort of a, a version on asteroids of what Venezuela did in the 70s. And as you can see, when the price of oil was uh, at its peak, uh, uh, Venezuela was having uh, deficits of 17% of uh, GDP. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the election year is a very you know, significant one, 2012, because President Chavez was sick and, and he sort of uh, engineered uh, uh, a massive expansion uh, during that year, uh, 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 a tremendous overvaluation of the exchange rate, a dramatic increase in imports, and all those distortions that were created in, in that year are sort of uh, 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 what we are sort of, uh, I mean, compounded with the decline in the price of oil at where, where uh, you know, sort of uh, causing what we, what we see today. And, and you can see there that the, that the pattern uh, the, the, the sort of there is a discrete jump in 2012 in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, deficits uh, expenditures. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, even though Venezuela had relatively uh, very poor uh, economic performance in terms of social indicators, uh, it did pretty well for a while. In, between 2004 and 2008, Venezuela had a very significant decrease in, uh, in poverty and in particular, uh, an explosion in, in consumption uh, per capita. And, and you can see that in real terms, consumption uh, grew by about 60% uh, during that period. And even, uh, in a, uh, even though if you compare it to other countries in the region, the, the performance is not as stellar, particularly given that those other countries were not receiving such a large uh, windfall, uh, still that uh, pretty much explains very well the popularity of President Chavez. And as you can see there, there is a very uh, a high correlation between the increase in real consumption and the popularity of, uh, of the president. So Chavez's uh, popularity went down during the adjustments after the financial crisis, but then he was able to, uh, to, to go back up, uh, as I mentioned, with the dramatic increase in, in consumption that he engineered. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, when we talk about Maduro, uh, you know, a big part of the explanation of the collapse in his popularity that we will see now has to do with that. And, and this is exactly what we see in this, uh, in this slide here. Uh, this is the, the, how do people evaluate how the country is doing uh, in, in general terms. Uh, and as you can see, the, the red line is, is uh, uh, looking at the, uh, a negative view, view outlook of the country, and, and the blue line is a, a positive one. And this is basically Maduro's uh, uh, tenure in power. And he started with about uh, you know, a, a majority thinking that the country was uh, uh, on, uh, doing well. And, and right now, it's close to 90% of the population uh, think that the country is, is, uh, is doing badly. And in terms of, uh, uh, of approval rating, Maduro today has a, an approval rating that I still find uh, significantly high if, if you compare to the previous uh, 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 slide, in the sense that it's 24% uh, 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 approval rating in co that contrasts with 10% uh, uh, of the population that thinks that th things are going, doing well. Uh, but uh, it's, of course, uh, the highest level of, of negative uh, 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 approval. Uh, I mean, he had uh, for a while in, in 2000 in this uh, data analysis poll a slightly higher uh, negative number, but, but, but uh, this is uh, a level that, that during the Chavismo has uh, never been uh, experienced. And that leads us to, to, to the elections. We have on, on December 6 uh, uh, legislative elections in Venezuela, and uh, today the numbers look, uh, I mean, if it, this was a normal country, it would be uh, uh, an obvious uh, landslide uh, victory for the opposition uh, in, in, in December, because the opposition is basically leading uh, uh, two to one uh, uh, in, in, in voting intention. 
And even if you um, filter by, um, I mean, the, the, the Chavismo is uh, a little bit, uh, has a little bit higher degree of, uh, of uh, mobilization than the, not than the opposition that, that much, but uh, as the sort of the non-aligned voters that, that are going to vote against the Chavismo in these elections. So, so the, if you filter for, for uh, likely voters, you get a better number for, for, for the Chavismo, but still, you know, the, 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 the margin is, is huge. Of course, this is a, an election uh, uh, that it's a, a, um, a not single member district because a few are two or three, uh, but, but the, this is a sort of a, a majoritarian uh, uh, election in, in many of the, of the, of the circuits. So uh, it's uh, difficult to predict with a national poll ha uh, what would happen, but uh, uh, everything points to a, toward a very significant uh, victory uh, by, by the opposition, and the question is, how will that be dealt with uh, by the Chavismo? Uh, uh, what would happen in terms of you know the the credibility of the of the results, and uh, and, and and how uh, will uh, a majority in the in the National Assembly by the opposition? Uh, uh, what what type of sort of a scenario will that uh, uh, lead to? Uh, so uh, let's look at, at the oil industry and, and then sort of gather everything uh, together. So. Uh, First point to, to keep in mind, Venezuela is uh, a country that is uh, uh, totally dependent on oil, much more dependent than even, even than, than, than some countries in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, and 96 percent of, of exports are uh, um, uh, oil uh, today. Uh, basically, doesn't export anything else. Uh, but that sort of contrasts with the, the, the line that you see there, that the net oil exports in terms of volume, in terms of barrels, uh, have been declining uh, significantly uh, for, for the past decade or so. So basically, the only thing uh, you know allowing Venezuela for this consumption boom was the price, uh, the oil price boom. And now uh, this dependence is becoming uh, really troublesome. And 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 so this is, uh, I mean, this this sort of cycle of of decline of the Venezuelan oil industry. It sort of reminds you a little bit of what happened in the during the 70s. Uh, uh, that, that basically, you know, the, the country did not invest uh, for very different reasons at the time. It was, you know, the private companies were uh, not being, uh, concessions were not being renewed and, and taxes were going up. And basically, Venezuela had a, a significant collapse in production uh, uh, in, in the early 70s uh, due to lack of investment, then uh, due to OPEC quotas. But then you see there was a big, big push uh, uh, of investment and, and production during the oil opening uh, in the 90s. And Venezuela uh, reached a, 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 a production uh, level that it's uh, almost a million barrels more, or a little bit less than, uh, like 800 uh, and something barrels. Uh, thousand barrels more than 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 it, that it what it produces today. The 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 dip there that you see in in, in the early 2000s, of course, is the is the oil strike, and so, but uh, the resource endowment of the country it's it's amazing. And and even though you know th this is a, an issue that uh, in which there is a lot of misinformation because you know the Venezuelan government published official figures of of oil reserves that are not uh, very credible in the sense that use a, a very high uh, recovery rate from the Orinoco belt that has never been achieved. Uh, but even if you sort of, you know, discount uh, uh, such uh, 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 numbers of, uh, of recovery rates, Venezuela would have instead of 300 billion barrels, say 170 or 180. So it would be, it will have reserves uh, second to Saudi Arabia, close, uh, very similar to the ones that Canada has in the in the in the tar sands. Uh, uh, similar to Canada, although although the break-even uh, cost of Venezuela are much lower than Canada, uh, it's you know extra heavy oil, so it's it's a uh, it's a type of oil that that it's uh, uh, and, uh, has lower margins and and, and has uh, and it's costly to sort of uh, transport and, and refine, etc. Uh, so even more so, if you uh, consider uh, how many years of reserves Venezuela has because of the low production. Remember that Venezuela has almost half the production of Canada, even though, as I said, conservatively has the same uh, reserves of, of Canada and officially has double the reserves of Canada or so. Uh, but Venezuela sort of has official uh, uh, sort of uh, the number of years of, of, of reserves at the current rate of production is 300 years. So, I mean, it, it, it might not mean too much uh, because uh, you know it, it's a, it's a number that it's a, uh, it's sort of like a, a infinity uh, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of public policy, but it, I think it's 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 uh, good to keep in mind. So 
The, the other uh, sort of uh, things that are uh, uh, sort of trends that are problematic of Venezuela is not only the decline in the, in the, in the production itself and, and, and the net exports uh, uh, that we will see, but it's sort of the, the mix. Uh, you know, uh, the, the red and blue lines in the, in the uh, right uh, uh, hand side uh, uh, figure show uh, the conventional oil in Venezuela. In, in the blue line is the, is the Maracaibo Basin, and the red line is the northeastern uh, conventional oil, uh, where the most productive fields of the country are. And, and as you can see, uh, particularly uh, worrisome is the, because Lake of Maracaibo had been declining for you know, years, and it has declined uh, more than a million barrels in the last decade, uh, in the last decade and a half. However, uh, uh, the case of, of the northern, uh, uh, northeastern Venezuela, it's, it's very problematic because these are the most productive fields of, of the country uh, that were used uh, to blend with the extra heavy and heavy uh, oil. Uh, so uh, those two trends are problematic. And then you can see that the only thing going up is the extra heavy oil uh, in the uh, Orinoco uh, area uh, of uh, Venezuela. The other uh, uh, thing that, that you can see in the, in the left-hand side is that the production done by PDVSA itself is declining even faster than the, production, than the total production of Venezuela. So the JVs, the, the partnerships with uh, uh, foreign companies, are the only ones uh, that are keeping uh, sort of production from not falling faster. Uh, uh, and so uh, that, that is, uh, uh, of course, uh, problematic in, in, in a variety of ways. First of all, because the cash flow of PDVSA uh, it's much less from uh, those projects than the one that they have from own operated uh, uh, projects. And particularly, uh, you have to keep in mind that PDVSA didn't invite anyone to the easy, low risk uh, uh, areas. So those are sort of lower margin, uh, more complex uh, uh, fields uh, are the ones who are increasing in production. And, and here you see the same thing. So, so you see the separate in, in between Orinoco JBs and, and conventional oil JBs. By the way, you will see both in the paper and here a combination of official figures from PDVSA. So, so uh, uh, if you see differences in figures, it's not uh, uh, that, that you are uh, wrong. It, that, that there, there are different figures because PDVSA has some figures and other uh, secondary sources have uh, slightly different figures with uh, lower levels of production, for example. So let's look at, uh, uh, in, in a little bit more detail what is happening in the Orinoco Bell, in the extra heavy non-conventional oil. And you can see there, like the existing projects have been uh, a slightly in increasing uh, uh, production, uh, and, uh, but the new projects, uh, and, 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 and mind the, the, the scale, which is totally uh, different, the new projects that were supposed to be producing at this point, uh, you know, about a, a, a million barrels or so, uh, are producing about 40,000 uh, uh, barrels. Uh, and uh, you can see the partners of these new projects there, uh, Gazprom, ENI, CNPC, Chevron uh, with the Japanese, and Repsol with the, with the Indian uh, national oil company. Um, so this has been uh, uh, a disappointment in the, in the sense that it has been, these projects have been uh, delayed and have uh, taken uh, much longer than it was expected, but, but something is happening there. So uh, uh, there is the prospect of, of a potential uh, uh, continued increase in the, in the Orinoco uh, area. In terms of, uh, uh, of exports, uh, so Venezuela's production is declining, net exports are declining, but the other problem is that a lot of the exports, a lot of the production at least is not paid for in the sense that of course the domestic market is a cash drain basically. Uh, we'll see that uh, in, in, in another slide. Uh, but the other thing is, that is the mix. Venezuela is exporting much less to the U.S., and, uh, and you, you can see that in this, uh, in this decline uh, um, uh, in, in imports from, from Venezuela. And by the way, very recently there has been a slight uh, increase, uh, but the, the, uh, which, which is for obvious pragmatic reasons to get you know, more, more cash. Uh, and there is a decline in the Petrocaribe and, and in the subsidized uh, exports of Venezuela. But still, uh, uh, the, the basic uh, point uh, continues uh, uh, being true that uh, almost half of the production of Venezuela is not, uh, uh, I mean, PDVSA doesn't get cash uh, from it. Uh, not all uh, is the same type of deal because, of course, part of it is, is uh, a repayment of loans uh, to China that the money did get to Venezuela, uh, but it was spent not by PDVSA but by the, by, by the government. So 
Uh, but this is sort of another uh, 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 problematic uh, 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 trend. And the other thing is that, you know, Venezuela is importing today almost, depending on the figures, between 200 and 300,000 uh, barrels of oil uh, per day, uh, about half of it uh, for uh, uh, as diluent uh, for extra heavy uh, oil. Uh, that, that includes products and, and light oil. Uh, and also it's importing uh, uh, more than, than it used to import for domestic uh, uh, consumption, and as I said, for, uh, at a significant loss. Uh, in terms of PDVSA itself, uh, you know, some, some uh, worrisome trends that had been happening even before the collapse in the price of oil include the fact that, you know, most of the money was being spent not in exploration and production, but in, you know, social programs and, and, and transfers to, to uh, discretionary uh, uh, government uh, funds. And the uh, debt of PDVSA, you know, increased dramatically from a very low level of $3 billion to about $46 billion today. And this is the financial debt if you add the debt to suppliers, partners, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, you have a, a, you know, an additional uh, uh, 10 to 15. It depends on how you measured it in terms of the exchange rate, so it's, a, uh, it's not a, a clear uh, figure. Uh, uh, and then you have the debt with the central bank, which is you know, something that, that, that sounds crazy, but you know, the Venezuelan government uh, owes 800 uh, billion bolivars. Uh, the uh, sorry, PDVSA owes 800 billion bolivars to uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the central bank, which basically, I mean, it's printing money to finance the domestic uh, expenditures of, of, of PDVSA. And then you have the arbitrations uh, that even though are not necessarily going to be paid by, by I mean, not, are, are owed by the, by the, by the, by the republic, by, by, the, by the government, not by PDVSA, they will have to be paid by, by PDVSA anyways. In terms of, uh, uh, I mean, in independent figures that, that we can find uh, on Venezuela, one, of course, that we uh, always look at is, is the number of uh, oil rigs in operation uh, reported by Baker Hughes. And there you see that they, it has not, uh, and, and if you look at it on, on average, it has uh, declined in the last uh, three years. There has been a uh, slight increase very recently, but on average, uh, the number of oil rigs in operation have been uh, pretty stable in the last few years, but with a slight decline. Uh, the, the other problem, of course, is, is the, the, the legacy of the, of the expropriation uh, uh, period in Venezuela. Venezuela is ranked the, as the country with the sort of the least attractive, with the most obstacle to investment in the Fraser Institute uh, uh, Index. And as you can see there, they were adding additional jurisdictions in the, in the bottom line here you see. And Venezuela keeps being the worst in the world. Uh, even if you add, uh, you know, 20 other countries, uh, uh, all are above Venezuela. So, Basically, I mean, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it, it, it's, it's a legacy that, that it's really costly in terms of attraction of investment, in terms of the, of the risk uh, that uh, uh, companies perceive uh, uh, that the country has. In terms of productivity, you know, uh, there are different, uh, I mean, it's sort of hard to measure the, the productivity with, uh, with the financial figures that we get, but one striking fact is that the number of barrels per employee has uh, uh, collapsed over the last uh, few years by a dramatic increase in the number of employees and the decline in production that we know. The, the domestic consumption is also an issue that, that there is some discrepancy. This is the BP figure, uh, and it says that it's uh, 124,000 barrels uh, per day. Some, uh, the Venezuelan government has a lower figure, and there are different estimates. But in any case, the, the, the clear pattern is a significant increase because, of course, partly because of economic growth during a period, but mostly because of the, the gasoline is, is free. If you, if you basically, you see here one, one thing that I, when I explain this to, to people in Saudi Arabia, they, they cannot, you know, Saudi has a, sells domestically at $21 per barrel uh, in domestic uh, gasoline. Venezuela sells uh, for one cent a barrel. Uh, 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 so basically, I mean, zero uh, for any, any, any. So, to, to conclude, so there are very uh, worrisome trends in the, in the oil industry in Venezuela. The, of course, the decline in production, but uh, more than proportional decline in net exports uh, because of the combination of the increase in the domestic uh, consumption and the, um, and the imports, the new imports, for both for uh, diluents and for, um, for the domestic market. Uh, limited exports, uh, I mean, the, the cash flow from exports, as I said, partly is not getting back to PDVSA. The, the basket of Venezuelan oil is becoming much heavier. Um, it's, uh, it's now sort of the reverse of what it was 10 years ago in terms of the mix between uh, extra heavy and heavy and, and, and light oil. 
uh, and the most productive fields of the country are, are, are declining, and PDVSA's own operated production is, is collapsing. Uh, the, the company has a lot of problems. The uh, debt rising investment is, is stagnant. Costs have been rising, productivity uh, collapsing. It has a very severe problem of human resources that, of course, started with the, with the firing of, of uh, half of the employees in 2003. But uh, recently, you know, the wages in, uh, in PDVSA are very low compared to uh, the international market. And even though today is not an easy uh, time to uh, find a, an oil job uh, out anywhere, uh, still, you know, uh, Venezuelans are willing to work for like a fraction of uh, anyone else. So it's, uh, 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 it's very hard for PDVSA to keep good people uh, in, inside the company. But all this is leading to something that I think is very important to keep in mind, which is a tremendous dose of pragmatism that, that I, I, I ask in the paper if it's pragmatism or desperation. I mean, the, 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 there are very strong signs that started about two years ago of the government trying to, to deal with this uh, crisis, signs of pragmatism that you don't see anywhere else in the Venezuelan public sector, I mean, in economic policy or, or in other areas. Uh, but here you see them, and, and th they start from symbolic things like uh, Reuters reported that, you know, that Eulogio del Pino, the new president of PDVSA, asked their executives to be on time to the meetings uh, with uh, foreign companies and, and dress uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, which was not the case before, uh, uh, that, that kind of thing. Two, uh, you know, to much more substan substantive things like the, the, the contract that they signed with, uh, with Chevron a while ago uh, that basically gives a lot of uh, control to the, over the cash flow to the partners and, and provides uh, uh, more operational control uh, uh, in, in the projects. The also, uh, uh, um, uh, they, they made the windfall tax, uh, they, they created an exemption and uh, make it flexible uh, in, in, in other cases, uh, they are working on, on issues of the uh, exchange rate that is used uh, for the oil industry. And, uh, and in terms of the strategy of PDVSA, you see a much more pragmatic uh, uh, strategy of focusing on, on blending and not you know, building upgraders, or, but, but totally focusing on, on, on increasing production in the Orinoco belt, which is the easy uh, way of, of increasing production and finding uh, diluents in the, in the world markets to, to blend it. Um, However, I, and the other example is the decline in Petro-Caribe exports and the increase in, in, US, in exports to the U.S. Uh, so, but all this pragmatism, I think, is unlikely to have a significant impact in the short term due to, first of all, of the low oil prices that particularly not because of the, it, of course, it, it affects the, the, you know, the, the, the capex that any international company is willing to invest in Venezuela, but most importantly, it affects PDVSA that doesn't have you know, enough capex uh, uh, to do what, what it should be doing. Uh, and then the, the human resources problems, the, the, the risk environment, and the, the, you know, the macro imbalances that, that Venezuela uh, is facing, that usually you know, the oil sector is sort of immune to that kind of thing. But, but of course, it affects your, your operation there, and uh, issues of instability, political instability, security issues. However, as I said, because of the tremendous endowment that Venezuela uh, has, uh, and I, and I, I think it's important to keep in mind, I think uh, some people ha get the wrong idea that Venezuela's oil is uncompetitive at, at the range of prices that we have uh, had recently. I think with the right conditions, Venezuela and Orinoco Belt could even be developed at, 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 at prices like $50 uh, uh, per barrel. Um, so if investor-friendly policies keep, uh, uh, continue, and if there is some uh, uh, sort of degree of political instability in the future, uh, particularly with a change in administration, if it's politically stable, and those are big ifs, uh, then there is a significant up upside potential in sort of the longer term. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Francisco, for that uh, great overview and uh, excellent paper, which I commend to all of you. I hope you'll, as I said, take a look on our website and read it. We're going to have a short conversation uh, about it now, get some reactions from our other panelists, and then open it up uh, to those uh, in the audience sitting here in person, as well as those watching online. Again, uh, you can submit your questions via Twitter at the hashtag CGEP events. So along with Professor Minaldi, uh, we're joined by, uh, to, um, to his right, by Luisa Palacios, um, 
who's Senior Managing Director and Head of Latin America Macro and Energy Research at Medley Global Energy Advisors. Uh, she joined Medley from Barclays, where she was a Latin American macro strategist in the uh, Emerging Markets Research Group, and before that was a Senior Energy Economist for uh, Japan Bank of International Cooperation, focusing on Latin America energy and economics, uh, and most importantly for our present purposes is a graduate of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, uh, as well as holding a PhD from uh, Johns Hopkins School, Johns Hopkins SAIS, uh, where she did her dissertation on the political economy of reforms in the oil industry in uh, Latin America. So very relevant expertise to the topic we're here to talk about today. And then to her right, I'm very excited to uh, give you Antoine's uh, new title, which is Senior Fellow and Director of the Global Oil Markets Research Program at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. Antoine has been in that job for about one week. Uh, his 20-year career <laughs> in energy spans uh, the world of government, international organizations, the private sector, uh, higher education, and he uh, most recently, before coming here, was the chief oil analyst at the International Energy Agency, where he was responsible for its two most authoritative publications, the Oil Market Report and the Medium Term Oil Market Outlook. Uh, before that was at the Energy Information Administration, held several private sector positions before that, uh, has served for several years, I forget, six years, I think, as an <coughs> adjunct professor, also here at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, um, and is co-editor of Energy, Poverty, Global Challenges, and Local Solutions from Oxford University Press, which Bill Clinton called a must-read for anyone serious about creating meaningful solutions to end poverty. I presume that's because I wrote one of the chapters. <laughs> um, so we're delighted that to have Antoine here today, and, and especially to have Antoine with us at the Center on Global Energy uh, Policy now, uh, given how important the issues are that we're here to talk about in uh, energy markets, policy, and geopolitics. Um, so let me just uh, let you let you each give a, a little bit of a uh, response, uh, Louisa, starting with you. Uh, generally to the paper and to the presentation you heard, what you agreed with and what you disagreed with, and particularly what, when you put it all together, what you think that means for the economic outlook and political situation in Venezuela that lies ahead. Those are many questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor uh, to be here with this distinguished uh, panel. Um, I think uh, I, I agree with, uh, with a lot of the conclusions that uh, Francisco has on the paper. I'm a little bit uh, less uh, um, constructive on the uh, pragmatism that I see from the Venezuelan, from the Venezuelan government. Uh, both uh, you do agree with uh, the economic policy front, but also on the oil policy front, uh, because I think it should be seen in a relative perspective. Um, when we look at what other countries, uh, uh, both in Latin America and the rest of the world, are doing in <coughs> relation to uh, uh, trying to adjust their oil industry to the fact uh, uh, that the oil prices are, uh, we, ha we are facing a new normal on oil prices, what I see is that, uh, uh, that Venezuela lags significantly behind, uh, uh, even if they're done, they have done some uh, uh, um, uh, small steps towards more pragmatism, they, they lag significantly behind other other countries. And just uh, uh, to show uh, 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 the second or the third most important producer in the region, uh, uh, which is Mexico, you know, it's going through a, a, a transformation in terms of its uh, energy sector, in terms of its uh, uh, opening, its uh, exploration and production uh, to private sector investments. But the discussions uh, uh, that I see uh, uh, in Argentina and in Brazil, in, uh, even in Brazil, uh, uh, in uh, in, in Colombia about what well, we have to uh, reduce the fiscal take, we have to make ourselves more attractive, we have to, so I don't see those, those discussions in, in Venezuela. I do see, you know, timidly a, a discussion about trying to reduce the royalty rate, which is 30% of the highest that, um, the highest certainly in Latin America to 20, but that has not pan out. Uh, so what I would say is that there are some, uh, some indications uh, uh, of certain pragmatism, but not to the extent that you would expect, given the magnitude of the shock that we're seeing. Uh, and so when I look at what has happened, and when I look at the indicators, I see that, uh, and, and I completely agree with, uh, with how Francisco has framed this, uh, uh, to me, Venezuela is migrating to a higher cost producer. It's not a high cost producer, it's just migrating 
bring to a higher cost producer than it was. Because the fact is that a conventional crude is a, is a, you know, Venezuela used to be a conventional crude producer, and it's now, uh, uh, as uh, Francisco clearly showed, uh, um, becoming a much heavier uh, producer, uh, developing non-conventional <coughs> oil resources. And, uh, and what I see is that the uh, basket of Venezuela is becoming heavier and heavier. I've done uh, calculations about the weighted average of Venezuelan oil basket, uh, um, and uh, we're already be below 16 uh, degrees API um, on a weighted average basis. Uh, and so it, 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 is, it is important that Venezuela has to import light oil in order to blend it with, uh, with its uh, 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 very heavy oil. Uh, the reason being is that it then becomes less competitive uh, because, uh, you know, we, we have had discussions about exactly what will the blend look like. Uh, we, I've seen in Canada that the blend is, uh, uh, because you have, Canada and Venezuela are moving away from the idea that you upgrade the heavy oil. It's the, the blending is, is what's the, the new business model. In Canada, it's 70 to 30 percent. In Venezuela, you probably uh, can do something, something less, between 30, may, maybe 20 percent. Either way, that increases the cost of production or the cost of developing that oil by 10 to 15 dollars. Uh, and so, in the in PDVSA's annual reports, what you can see is a constant increase in the uh, in the cost of producing oil, which is now the oil in Oco is about 20 to 25 dollars. So you add uh, 10 dollars to that. That's already. Uh, um, you're between 30 to 35, and we're not even talking about uh, income taxes. And so, to me, this is a, when you are a country that is moving, uh, uh, it's, it's doing the opposite than the shell oil producers are doing. Instead of uh, cutting costs, it is increasing cost. Uh, and the problem of, uh, of, uh, of Venezuela, uh, uh, you know, not, uh, although the, yes, the oil sector is exogenous in a way to the rest of the economy, what I would argue is that that is a, that is actually not the case in Venezuela because it does matter whether the oil sector does use its domestic capacity, domestic supply capacity in general. And I say this because one of the important things that I see in Latin America is that the significant <coughs> evaluations that we have seen of depreciations of the currency at the end do affect also capex. I mean, you can do, you can negotiate, uh, renegotiate contracts, you can lower or increase the component of domestic uh, uh, suppliers to uh, your capex. And so the decrease in capex doesn't have to be that, 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 that dramatic. But if the country doesn't produce anything or there's a significant collapse in the production of everything in, in Venezuela, what that means is that your capex is highly dollarized, which means that Venezuela actually doesn't have a lot of capacity to reduce the cost of production. So it does matter what your macro situation is. And so in a way, the oil sector is, is understood as an exogenous industry, but I think the macro situation significantly affects the oil industry, and the oil industry affects the macro situation. It's a two-way street. Let me stop there with the comments. But, uh, and can you talk a little bit about the political outlook mm -hmm. as you see it? How concerned should we be about the stability of the regime in Venezuela? And what <coughs> play out a few scenarios for how that might look based on the oil price fall. Me? Luis. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. okay. And, then, and then you as well, no, no. Francisco. Um, uh, because this is an extremely highly dependent country in, in oil, uh, um, I think what we're seeing is that the country that is not adjusting either in the oil sector in a significant way or in the economic front um, is what you're seeing stresses all across the uh, all, all across the, uh, the sector. So you see stresses on the economic front. You see stresses on the domestic economy. You see stresses on the political system. And so, as, as Francisco was saying, we're heading towards uh, legislative elections. Um, what I what I see is this, this is a, a government that has a, a particularly high exit cost, um, and it's heading towards an election that could be decisive uh, uh, in terms of uh, what it means for uh, politics and for regime change going forward. And so there are a lot of questions about how exactly are these elections going to unfold because at each point, at each decision, at each uh, juncture in which this government has had to decide between abiding by democratic rules or not, it has decided not. And so uh, in all the other instances, maybe it was not as dramatic as an election, right? Uh -uh. And so we're heading towards an, a very important election in a country that is receiving, is in the, in the midst of significant economic stresses with one of the highest inflations in the world, with scarcity of goods and services, with the high unemployment. I mean, where, where in any other country you would have seen significant social tensions emerging, but, but in Venezuela you have not seen them yet uh, uh, in, uh, in part uh, uh, because the government has a significant uh, lead 
uh, uh, on, uh, on, on the population, uh, either through uh, uh, complete control of the media that prevents uh, 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 riots or some kind of manifestations from propagating or becoming uh, massively known, and, and that's, a, 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 you know, it, uh, it creates a, a, a repeating mechanisms. So, so you have completely dismantled that. You have also uh, 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 followed <coughs> or used your security forces, your military, to control more and more uh, uh, any kind of signs of social, social distress. So the elections, what I see is that the Maduro administration, in a way, has dismantled any, any possibility of political um, uh, um, aggregation of, of, of political manifestation of, of differences, of, of wanting change, both on the economic and the political front. So the elections, to me, are, are a very important uh, moment for Venezuelan politics, because it is, uh, uh, if, there's, if uh, the elections uh, uh, take place and the opposition is allowed to win, uh, uh, I think it will, be, it will be significantly important for the political stability of Venezuela. Uh, because that is, uh, it, will be, it will show that at the end, uh, you know, there is a, a, some kind of, a, of limit uh, uh, and that democratic institutions or the, at some kind of a democratic uh, 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 role uh, 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 continues to exist, which will allow the possibility of an institutional change. Uh, uh, and that's very important for the stability uh, of, of the country. Uh, um, not only politically and economically, but I would also say for the, for, for the oil industry uh, uh, in general. Because uh, we do get uh, uh, asked a lot the question of whether Venezuela could become a geopolitical risk uh, at some point. I mean, whether the political uh, situation could end up uh, uh, making Venezuela a geopolitical risk. And I, what I would say is that- It's not one now. It's not one now, uh, 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 and it's not one in many other political scenarios. Uh, uh, if those political scenarios play out, even if it's in a longer uh, time frame, in a, at some point towards a regime change in an in institutional way. Uh, and so elections, the, uh, the appearance, the, the, the fact that elections can take place and that the opposition, which as uh, uh, Francisco clearly showed, has such a big gap, uh, uh, is allowed to win, uh, 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 which many people in the country are very concerned about, will, I think will significantly alleviate uh, the tensions and allow the process uh, to take place, even if it's a longer process. But if that doesn't happen, uh, um, what I would say is that you enter into a much more unstable type of uh, scenario, uh, one in which uh, uh, many other things, uh, I mean, anything can happen, because then you don't, don't even allow the possibility that a population that is 80% against you uh, uh, shows their uh, discontent. There is just no way uh, uh, for, uh, 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 for, the, for the system uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to allow uh, uh, change to take place, and, and that to me leads to a much more explosive uh, situation in, in, at some point. Francisco, Manal, did you, you, do you agree with that and, and, and yeah. your, out, your perception of geopolitical risk and the potential for political instability in Venezuela? Yeah, well, uh, let, let's uh, go. I, I think I generally agree with everything that Luisa said, including the things that she disagreed with me uh, before. <laughs> um, but uh, let, let me go to the politics. I mean, on, on the politics, the, the, the scenarios are, I mean, first of all, you have to keep in mind that this, with these margins, the logical conclusion anywhere else would be that the opposition will get a two-thirds majority. And so there will be a landslide that will, could lead to regime change yeah. in, if, you know, if, the, if the rules of the game were played with. There are a variety of reasons why uh, that, might pro that is probably unlikely, including, of course, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, limits to, to the democratic expression of the vote, but also, you know, malapportionment is very significant, and the, ru the rural areas are dominated by, by the Chavismo still. Uh, the, the Chavismo uh, did a lot of gerrymandering that, that sort of make it, uh, that, that allows them to be a little bit um, more represented than, than, than otherwise they would be. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there, are, there is the, 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 the worry that there might be uh, some uh, uh, fraud, fraud in the, in the elections, uh, on the day of the elections. You know, the electoral, one of the most explosive, I think, issues is that, you know, the, the, the Electoral Council in Venezuela is totally distrusted uh, by the country. So uh, we're heading to this very uh, crucial election uh, with uh, no arbiter that is respected by, by, by anyone. Uh, so that's, uh, that's I think, uh, going to be a, a, a potentially a, a big problem. But I agree with, with Luisa that the most explosive scenario is if the, if the Chavismo <laughs> does not allow this uh, uh, electoral majority to, to, to lead to at least you know, a simple majority yeah. in, the, in the National Assembly because both the international community and everyone, I mean, for the first time, you know, uh, not only the opposition is a majority, but voters 
believe that the opposition is a majority, a, a significant majority. So they, uh, they will be really upset uh, by the fact that, that this election doesn't lead to a, uh, to a majority in the, in, the, in the National Assembly and, uh, for the opposition. Of course, uh, as Luisa mentioned, the exit costs for this regime are, are very significant uh, uh, for a, you know, a variety of reasons, extremely polarized country, um, uh, all the issues that have to do with uh, um, uh, um, um, human rights, uh, drug trafficking, all, all sorts of things that, that, uh, uh, that, that sort of are around uh, uh, the issue. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's going to be uh, very difficult. And, and the other thing is that you don't see clear sort of, um, you know, the opposition is it's a, it's a very weak, uh, weakly uh, um, uh, tied uh, coalition, and there are no clear uh, leaders that are the ones that you should be negotiating with on, on either side. So it's a, it's a very complex uh, uh, situation. However, I tend to agree, maybe for lack of imagination uh, uh, as a Venezuelan, that, that, that it's unlikely that we will have you know, a major geopolitical event or a disruption, right. a massive disruption in, in, in production or things uh, of, that, uh, of that nature. Uh, but my colleagues that have followed these type of situations in other regions of the world seem to be, they look at the, at the facts and they say, well, I don't know why you are so, so uh, optimistic about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, And so we talked about the impacts uh, within Venezuela. I just wanted to ask you also about more outside Venezuela, regional impacts. Um, Venezuela maintains subsidized oil sales and product sales to many um, Caribbean and Latin American uh, countries under the Petro Caribe Agreement. To what extent are economies in, outs in the region uh, exposed to risk, and what could the potential political uh, impacts be, geopolitical risk impacts be, uh, more broadly? You want to start with that, or? Um, Okay, I mean, I am not an expert in the in the in the region of in the Caribbean region, but but I mean, the first fact is that uh, the exports uh, subsidized exports are being cut significantly. So these countries are gonna are gonna suffer. Uh, of course, this happens when the price of oil is much lower than it was before, and it would have been a, a disaster for them at, at a very high uh, price uh, because they were be, be you know paying a hundred dollars mm -hmm. per barrel. Now they're paying. Less, but it's still, it's, it's, you know, it's a significant, for some countries it's actually dramatic. I mean, like Haiti and, and some other uh, countries in the Caribbean. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I had a meeting uh, with uh, people that, that follow these countries and they were pretty worried about it. Um, uh, that, by the way, includes uh, Cuba itself, uh, uh, that, that even though it's probably the country that is going to be uh, caught the least uh, compared to, to others, uh, uh, apparently they are also being, uh, being caught. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, I think, a, a certainty that, that, that we have that this is going to continue happening. I mean, the regime, uh, it's very interesting because, you know, the, the, everyone sort of seems the, the obvious connection between the voting in the OAS and, <laughs> and the, and the Petro-Caribe program. And they just, last week just had one, first the vote in which some, for the first time, some Caribbean yeah. countries sort of didn't vote with Venezuela. But then you had a meeting of Petro-Caribe in which uh, Maduro offered even more uh, yeah. for the future, uh, uh, you know, uh, promise of, of things. So it's 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 sort of a, a very, uh, you know, it's a game of uh, sort of. Uh, I mean, the, I think everybody in the in the region knows that that uh, that this is going to uh, be dramatically uh, cut and and that they cannot count on Venezuela. But everybody is trying to get as much as as, as they can while it lasts. Um, uh, so so that's uh, one uh, one potential uh, fall off. The, the, of course, the, the the other issues you are seeing now in the border with uh, with uh, Colombia. You know the 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 the, the, the debacle in Venezuela will have uh, some some impact in in in, in Colombia, and, and and the other. I mean, in terms of the sort of uh, of the sort of the market, the, the oil market in, in the region, as Luisa mentioned, you know the the, the competition from. From Mexico, uh, uh, it's really uh, you know going be, going to be a very significant uh, new factor to to re reckon uh, for for Venezuela, uh, because now you have the country that was the closest. I mean, Venezuela was much more open than Mexico during the Chavismo in the oil sector, uh, uh, but now it has a, a formidable uh, competitor in the region that that has a. Uh, in some ways, a similar. Uh, I mean, it has a lot of yeah. heavy oil too, and and so it's a, it's a, it, it's going to be a problem for Venezuela. Um, Antoine Half, let me let me uh, ask you to kind of put it in the broader 
context of the global oil market today, how should we think about, how do you think about Venezuela? How important is it? Based on what you heard Francisco present in his study, how do you think that impacts the outlook, which we've seen this sort of historic price collapse in the last year, how does that impact uh, how does that impact the outlook? And, and, and are you or do you think markets are as complacent as we heard Francisco and Lisa are about the you know, potential for outages, geopolitical risk in Venezuela? Mm. Well, I think it's, a, it's an extremely important country. And I do agree that the, the market is a bit complacent about uh, Venezuela today, uh, partly because we are at a moment in the oil market when we live under the impression that we've moved to an age of abundance from, a, from an age of scarcity. <coughs> uh, there's plenty of oil uh, being produced in the US. Dependency on Venezuelan supplies in the US has decreased. It's not just that the Venezuela is less able to produce uh, than it was in the past. It's also that the need for Venezuelan oil has decreased in, in the US at, at this time. Uh, but there's also plenty of supply elsewhere in the world. And uh, right now, uh, Venezuelan supplies matter less for the market as a whole than they have perhaps at other times in history. Uh, but they do matter tremendously, uh, nevertheless. And even though it's less than it used to be, it's still a very large chunk of the market. And it's not just the volumes being produced. They're down, but they're still very high. But it's also the location, the way Venezuela fits within the, the region, within the Americas, uh, within the Gulf of Mexico. It, it's still very important for uh, Gulf of Mexico refiners because it's a, a one source of heavy oil. Heavy oil is less valuable than light oil, but for refiners, it's much more interesting in, in the US market, precisely because of the shale revolution. The, the shale is extremely light, and that makes the need or the appetite for cheaper, heavier oil all the greater uh, in, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. So paradoxically, Venezuela matters less, but in some ways it, it matters more. Uh, then it's, it's very important uh, historically because uh, Venezuela has always had a very unique role in the leadership, in the global governance of the oil industry in the oil market. It's been a leader of OPEC. It's been a, a leading cheater also <laughs> within OPEC. Uh, then it's been a leading enforcer of OPEC discipline. It's gone through cycles up and down, uh, resource nationalism, opening apertura, nationalism again. So now the question is, uh, are we going, uh, are we on the, on the cusp of another cycle of opening and, uh, and um, uh, business friendliness and higher production? Or has the, the pendulum swing <coughs> suddenly uh, come to a halt and uh, is it frozen and unable to move back and, and continue the, the kind of dynamic swing that uh, it has displayed historically? So I think the, the paper is really great because it uh, it's comes at a very timely, uh, it's very timely, it comes at a moment when uh, politically uh, Venezuela looks like it could be at a, at a turning point. Uh, and I don't think there's any huge surprise in the paper. There's nothing that uh, you know, uh, made me think oh, I was completely wrong about this. But there's a huge degree of granularity and it's also extremely clear, concise, and, and dispassionate. It's, always, it's, it's very fact-based, very granular, very detailed, very articulate, and very synthetic. So it's really helpful to try to understand what the issues are and to try to uh, frame the questions that are before us. Uh, but I think the questions remain largely open. We, we don't really know uh, how things will play out, how the impact of the elections uh, will, will uh, affect production, will affect the, the country as a whole and will affect its role in the market. Uh, what's remarkable, uh, I think, when we look at Venezuela over the last few years, especially since the, the, the price collapse, <coughs> when the price collapsed uh, starting uh, about a year ago, uh, almost all the analysts in the oil market said, well, the, the price is collapsing, so production will collapse. The, the, the price drops, so the uh, oil revenues that can be reinvested into production uh, are drying out, companies are cutting their spending, cutting their budgets, so there will be less production. And in fact, the exact opposite has happened. There has been more production since the price has collapsed for reasons that we can understand. I mean, so part, part of it is just the resilience of the U.S. industry and the reasons why <coughs> U.S. shale is so productive, so resilient. Uh, but part of it is that countries that depend on, the, on their oil revenues, uh, when the price collapses, in fact, 
have an incentive to produce more because they need to make up in volume what they lose in, in, uh, in revenue per barrel. And even some of the countries that seem the least capable of increasing production have been able to increase production in this downturn. Russia, faced with sanctions, faced with a collapsing currency, uh, faced with a dramatic drop in revenues, has been able to achieve record levels of production in recent months. Uh, Nigeria, with all these problems, has maintained reasonably high levels of production, has been creeping up production over the last few months. Uh, Iraq, with the uh, Islamic State uh, insurgency or campaign, has lost a third of its territory, uh, it's facing humongous uh, above ground problems. Uh, the impact of the price collapse has been dramatic on the budget, on the financial resources of the country. It's producing at record highs. Uh, only Venezuela has not been able mm -hmm. to uh, achieve this kind of performance. Uh, and this is interesting, and this raises questions, why is, is that the case? Uh, partly it's because Unlike, for instance, Saudi Arabia, which also has been producing at record highs, or other Gulf countries, there's no buffers. Uh, some countries have had financial buffers they have been able to rely on. Uh, Venezuela doesn't have those buffers. The production, the nature of the resource is difficult. It, it's becoming tough oil. It's, it's, it's difficult oil. It's not an easy resource to develop. And just the legacy of the mismanagement of the Chavez years, it's just the, the, the damage has been uh, so uh, large that it's very difficult to overcome uh, on the dime. Now, the question, I think, is what happens next? What happens if uh, the opposition wins the election or if Maduro continues on his pragmatic approach? Is there a potential for things to improve in the next few months? And one, and I don't have the answer to that question, but I think one line of argument would say, yes, there's tremendous potential for more production because they've been underperforming, they've been playing their cards so badly that there are many low-hanging fruits. It would be easy to bring investment back and to get the house in order and to get production back again uh, on the rise. Uh, but another uh, line would be, no, uh, there's going to be uh, a period of, a uh, prolonged period of unrest, uncertainty, instability, perhaps civil war, perhaps fighting. Uh, that sometimes doesn't stop production from going. Iraq, Libya have been producing in the midst of civil wars. Uh, how would that play out in Venezuela? Uh, I think we can argue this uh, back and forth. Uh, but also, the, another issue is, has, the, has there been, and that maybe that's one issue where your paper doesn't go too much in depth, has there been long-lasting damage caused to the reservoirs by the mismanagement of, uh, of PDVSA under Chavez? Um, and you know, the resources are huge, but the producing fields uh, have been mismanaged and has the, uh, have, been, have, have they been exhausted? Has the pressure been depleted? Uh, is there some long-lasting loss of capacity uh, that Venezuela uh, has suffered and that might not be able, might not be easy to, to recover or, or might never be recovered uh, in future? So mm -hmm. that's some of the questions I think that we face. Did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I, th I think that's a very important question, and it's hard to, to answer because we don't have, you know, uh, transparent information for sure. One, uh, some signs, I mean, of some of the things that you mentioned. I mean, the, the Venezuelan government is being able to increase production in the Orinoco Belt, as, as, as you saw. So the easy thing, which is sort of, you know, bringing uh, some uh, additional investment into an area with zero geological risk. I mean, because even though it's, there are uh, other problems with uh, the extra heavy, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that it's pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, you drill, you, you extract. The, the, the issue is getting the infrastructure right and bring, bringing the diluent. But in the more complex, in the, in the existing conventional fields, that's where, uh, I mean, the, the, all the tales that you hear from service contractors, et cetera, is that the, the infrastructure is in, in, in total uh, disrepair. It's in very bad shape. And that uh, things are going to keep going down in terms of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, even, you know, major accidents, uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, problems of all sorts are going to continue uh, to, 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 to go up. So that, that's a, 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 a potentially a big problem. And there is the, the notion among some uh, geologists 
that the more productive fields were uh, uh, exploited in a way that uh, you know destroyed the future uh, production uh, uh, capacity. So, so there seems to be a lot of, of, of what you're mentioning. On the other hand, if you want to look at sort of the the, the half uh, full, half empty. You know, even if you consider uh, the, the conventional reserves of Venezuela, you know, the, the, the conventional reserves of Venezuela, nobody knows exactly which they are because never been audited, and they are suspiciously, suspiciously stable. Uh, however, if you, uh, uh, if you sort of uh, take uh, a figure and then you even divide it by two and, and you, you know, take some uh, assumptions, you know, Venezuela has 20 times or 10 times the reserves of, of Colombia in, in conventional oil. So if, if you had, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, an institutional environment uh, that it's uh, more uh, uh, amenable to small companies that can be, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, et cetera, you, you, uh, 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 you could significantly turn around, I think, eventually, uh, uh, the production. And you see that even under these terrible circumstances, you know, production in the non-PDVSA uh, uh, projects in the JVs is slightly going up has been slightly going up uh, uh, for a while, and there is some investment happening. Uh, so even though uh, I totally agree with Luisa that if you compare it to, if, you, if, you, if your comparison, your point of comparison is the rest of the region, you know, for example, Chevron is both in Venezuela and in Argentina, right? In, in Argentina, they are being, you know, like offered anything to, yeah. to invest, and it's sort of a, a, a tremendously uh, attractive environment uh, given the, the, the situation of the world market. Uh, in Venezuela is much less uh, interesting. Uh, however, they are investing some money in Venezuela, and they are slowly increasing uh, production there. So, uh, so, so there, there, there is uh, some uh, movement. And, and the other com point of comparison, as I mentioned, uh, was is with the rest of what is happening in Venezuela. You know, it, it's you see that you know the head of PDVSA is a guy who knows about oil. Uh, you see that you know these uh, symbolic th changes that I mentioned. You see, uh, and, and even though they are. Uh, as still very far from doing what they need to do, uh, it's, it's surprising how uh, uh, much uh, sort of change in, in strategy there has been compared to other sectors. Um, yeah, Luisa, go ahead. I was uh, going to comment on, on one thing that I think you're completely right, uh, uh, which is Venezuela matters particularly for the uh, derivatives market, uh, because where I do think that there's a, the, the cuts in CapEx in Venezuela <coughs> have been in have, have been important, and so you invest only in exploration and production, so the refinery front is, uh, is in disarray. The amount of stoppages uh, that you have, you are operating at 50-60% utilization capacity, so the probability that you have accidents, like the one that we had in, in uh, Amoy, for example, Cardón, uh, uh, where you know that was a, an, an event for the for for at least the product market uh, for you know pretty much a month. Uh, so I think that's a, a more likely scenario under whatever political uh, 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 more likely event, but whatever political scenario you want to uh, uh, you want to uh, envision. I do think that political scenarios matter uh, for the probability that you have a significant disruption in oil production. That's a much more difficult uh, thing to do, like the 2000 and 2003 strike. I think the probability of that happening is um, <coughs> much less uh, uh, under different political scenarios. There's one political scenario, which is, well, if the country simply is in total chaos, then you know at least the oil markets are going to be bullish about that, because eventually there could be a much important disruption. That said, what I see, and, and I think your comment about that, in the only place that you don't see uh, uh, increases in oil production is Venezuela, which according to their own numbers, since December, they've lost 70,000 barrels per day of oil production. And I think that uh, uh, talking about what, uh, what uh, Francisco is saying is that to me, that the loss of, of technical capacity and mismanagement is such that you see it in the declines in conventional crude, which I think are about, you know, every year about 80 to 100,000 barrels per day. So they have to bring on stream. 100,000 barrels per day of Orinoco, and as you just mentioned, uh, uh, they've brought in half of the year only 40. And so you are seeing the declines because conventional crude continues to decline. For example, <coughs> I completely agree that um, El Furrial, which is like, uh, to me, it's like the Venezuela's mini Cantarel situation, because that was the biggest, the, the largest field producing 500,000 barrels, about yeah. 400,000 barrels mm -hmm. per day in, uh, you know, in 2012, has lost 30% of, uh, of its capacity in two years. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that's the most dramatic one, right? And so I do think that, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the government in, in, in this, uh, at this uh, rhetorical uh, uh, mentioning of things that they would like to do is that, oh, we're going to launch a margin of fields round. 
Well, that's where technical capacity matters. I mean, because uh, the Mexicans can pull it off, uh, uh, and Venezuela would have been able to pull that off uh, at any other point in time. But now, uh, uh, understanding how to do an auction of marginal fields, what fields, you know, it's uh, just takes longer. So that's where I do think that technical capacity <coughs> matters, and those political scenarios matter. The regime change. I think then that would be actually not positive for the oil markets because there will be, uh, uh, although this is not even, uh, I think talking about regime change is not really an imminent thing. Uh, I think it's going to take a while for this to happen. But, but it does matter your political scenario for understanding where oil production is going. And for, for the time being, my base case scenario is that uh, what you're going to see is continuous declines of oil production. Like uh, last year was 100,000 barrels per day. This year could be somewhere between 50 to 100,000 barrels per day. Uh, and I think the other event that we have not talked about is the effect that uh, eventually holds could have on <coughs> Venezuela, uh, um, which it's not obvious uh, uh, exactly the timing of that, uh, the probabilities of that, but I would say that that will constrain as well uh, uh, and could accelerate declines. But uh, uh, in all of those scenarios, it's not a, uh, a geopolitical risk per se, but just uh, an acceleration of decline. And when we think about the fiscal strain on the government, you look at the declining production, and as you showed, also the sharply rising consumption that they're essentially giving away for free. We've seen several countries, mostly oil importers, but also oil exporters like the United Arab Emirates, uh, cut, re use this opportunity of low oil prices to reduce uh, fuel subsidies. subsidies. Is there any prospect of seeing pricing reform in Venezuela? Well, I, before the election, I think we can uh, pretty much be sure that it's not going to happen. But you know, they have been announcing this for a while uh, already, and, and it, from time to time, they sort of they, they start talking about it, and then it, uh, the president says, "No, it's not going to happen anytime soon." I mean, uh, the issue is now, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, more significant because also the, the massive smuggling to Colombia uh, and part of the border issue has to do with that. Um, uh, I think it's it's going to happen. I think uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, they, they they need some institutional capacity to implement it because if they if they increase it in any meaningful meaningful way, it will hurt. Uh, you know, the the it will be a a, 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 a tough thing for 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 a, a segment of the population. Even 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 though you know it's very regressive subsidy, still for the poor it's uh, you know mm -hmm. it's relevant, and 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 so you have to have like in Iran they did, you have to have a, a, compensa a compensation mechanism. And, and they have been very uh, incapable of implementing any type of policy of that, of that sort. Uh, but I think it will, uh, it will eventually happen. Mm -hmm. The other you know, major and crazy uh, issue that has a lot to do with all that we are talking about is the, is the issue of the exchange rate, right? You know, Venezuela has a, a hundred time difference between the black market and the, most, and the lower uh, uh, official exchange rate. And, and that is even sort of easier to do uh, than increasing the, the gasoline price, and they have been unable uh, uh, to do anything uh, 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 significant uh, in, in exchange rate reform. And uh, uh, theoretically, you know, they are waiting for the elections. But then, you know, what happens if the elections, either the opposition uh, has a big win or, or you know, even, uh, you know, uh, yeah. w whatever scenario, do you think that in January they could make a huge adjustment <laughs> on the exchange rate? I mean, it's, it doesn't look like also a good time <laughs> either. So, so uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's really, uh, and, 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 and you need a government with some degree of cre credibility. The other issue that we haven't, Mentioned, and, and I'm not macroeconomist, but you know, the, the there is a risk of hyperinflation in, 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 in Venezuela, and I'm talking about real mm -hmm. hyperinflation, mm -hmm. not you know, not, not the high inflation that we're seeing now, but you know, the, the one that overthrows governments and that creates the tensions that we yeah. saw in other regions. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so that you know, might be the, the event that actually leads to mm -hmm. some uh, significant uh, political uh, change, uh, you know, a real hyperinflation. I will just say on that topic of fuel subsidies, I mean, there's a broad consensus that they are both economically and environmentally wasteful because they encourage too much consumption. Uh, the question, of course, politically is how do you roll them back without riots in the streets? And so we were interested in that question and uh, decided to look at success stories and what lessons could be learned from a political economy perspective on what how to remove fuel subsidies successfully. And um, Johannes Erbelinen in the political science department here at Columbia has written with some co-authors a paper for us on that that'll come out in a couple of weeks. And uh, if you're on our mailing list, you'll see that. Mm -hmm. um, let me open it up now to questions from the audience. Uh, if you could stand up and stand at the microphone in the aisle, that would be helpful. Let me remind those watching online that you can ask questions uh, with the hashtag CGEP 
uh, events. Uh, and for those listening to the podcast, all our events are available on podcasts through iTunes, uh, as well as on our website. Uh, just a reminder that we're here with Francisco Minaldi from Rice University, Luisa Paliasos from uh, Medley Global Advisors, and Antoine Half from the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. If you could please briefly identify yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, hi, my name is Mariana Martina, I'm Venezuela, and I'm a CIPA, recent CIPA graduate. Um, I have a question about the elections, actually. We've seen in all the elections that happen every year in the past 16 years that this um, um, enormous spending from PDVS, finance from PDVSA to election, and given this election is significantly important and they're struggling with the popular support, uh, do you think we're going to see again this enormous spending on the elections? And then my second question is related to that. Yes, it is very significant, and if the opposition wins, I also think it's going to be a big legway to change. Do you think that's going to be the case if the opposition doesn't win the two-third ma third majority? Thank you. Who'd like to take that? Well, uh, briefly uh, on the uh, on the issue of uh, you know the, the, as you mentioned, the, the playbook of the Chavismo in any important election has been to to engineer a massive you know expenditure boom and and, and do every uh, sort of the extreme version of of a political business cycle. However, this time is uh, it's much more difficult than any time before, and I think we are already you know less than three months from from the election and, and anything they. Uh, they can do in the classic sort of sense of increasing uh, expenditure, increasing imports, etc. cetera, uh, it's unlikely to have a, a dramatic effect. There could be other non standard, non-traditional things. You know, in Venezuela, everyone talk about the DACASO, which is, you know, the previous year, the previous elections, uh, uh, the, the president announced that uh, uh, electrical appliances will be sold at a, a fraction of the of, the, of their uh, price, and, and he got a bump of 10% in the <laughs> in the polls before the election. I think these kinds of events are harder to, to manufacture uh, right now because the disenchantment is very deep. Uh, uh, and, and you, you see the numbers, uh, the distrust in the government is very, is very significant. There is very uh, difficult to, to build, again, a sort of a honeymoon kind of, uh, of effect. Uh, uh, however, we can expect something uh, to happen if we, <laughs> we see the, the recent history. Uh, uh, one thing that actually worries me is, that, uh, is how dramatic the uh, scenario is looking in terms of you know, the, the, the advantage by the opposition because in some radical elements in the government they might feel that there is you know, no way uh, that, that, uh, that this uh, scenario uh, is acceptable to them and they might be willing to do some crazy, uh, crazy stuff. Uh, in terms of the two thirds or, or one, uh, I mean, I think it's, this is a scenario, it's more a political than an institutional scenario. You know, it's in the end, I think it's much more how both internally and internationally uh, uh, this transition is, uh, is uh, uh, able to be engineered. A government that has s such a low level of support in a normal democracy can be sustained because there is a general legitimacy, but here in a very polarized environment, uh, uh, it's m much harder uh, uh, for, for, for it to continue the business as usual uh, that, that we're seeing. So it, I think it will be a very, very difficult uh, uh, a moment. And, and of course, we cannot uh, discard a, a variety of, uh, uh, of scenarios, but, but I think uh, the most likely one is, uh, is, uh, is a victory of the opposition with at <coughs> least some significant uh, uh, number of additional deputies. Not, I don't, it's much harder to believe that two thirds. Next question. Uh, good evening, <clears throat> Albert Goldstein, Indo-Brazilian Associates. Um, question specifically how it impacts um, Venezuela. The short-term issue is that there's an OPEC meeting coming up uh, November 27th, and I uh, just want the panel's assessment. What do you think will come out of that meeting? How will, to what extent can Venezuela persuade OPEC members to uh, establish any sort of a, a production um, quota to actually enforce it? The other basically is also longer term. In the United States, there's legislation that would permit the um, export of refined petroleum products. Now, granted, Venezuelan oil is completely different. It's a heavier type of oil versus what we export, which is Louisiana light. And of course, it has different margins. However, that would still represent significant additional petroleum products on the market, particularly um, in, in the region. I just want the panel's assessment of, of those um, those scenarios. Who wants to take that? 
I can start and I think um, I mean briefly on the on the products I mean and it's not I mean the products can be exported now what what you are thinking about is about oil uh, being lighter oil being exported uh, I, I, by the way I think it, it would be great for Venezuela if the, if you know if the restrictions on on export of uh, of light oil from the US uh, get uh, either lifted or 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 at least at some point if Venezuela can establish a deals of swaps or something because if there is a natural <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, uh, deal to be made there because Venezuela needs light oil, uh, and uh, and the, the the closest and least uh, easiest to get is from the U.S. So, so that would be uh, in the long run uh, something that we might uh, see uh, happening. Uh, in terms of the, the the OPEC, I think you know, of course, Venezuela is desperate. I mean, it's the only country in OPEC that is not being able to increase production. Everybody else, you know, is basically either increasing it or like Iran expecting to increase uh, significantly. So, so Venezuela is, is in a desperate situation. They, they, as you know, have tried to broke uh, meetings with uh, the Russians to, 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 sort of to, 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 uh, to come up uh, to, to some deal. I'm not an expert on the, on the Middle East producers, but my, my impression is that, that this is not uh, likely to... to uh, and in fact, I think the, 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 the efforts by Venezuela being so openly unsuccessful, actually, it's a sort of in a negative, uh, you know, it it's shows more and more how, at some point, I, I guess that if the price uh, colla uh, collapses even more, there might be some, some uh, uh, but, but I don't think Venezuela, even though, uh, as uh, Antoine mentioned, has had an historically a, 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 a role that it has been more significant than it should be because of the size of, of, of production in, in, the, in, the, in OPEC, uh, I, I think it's also unlikely to, to have some. Antoine, does the does U.S. oil export policy matter for Venezuela, or does it just displace if they sell us more crude, or, or if they don't sell it to us, they sell it to someone else? Does well, it? No. <clears throat> well, I think I agree. It, it would uh, be a benefit for Venezuela if crude exports were uh, opened up more broadly in the U.S., because refiners would be very happy to <coughs> to ship out uh, light crude and to import heavier crude from Venezuela. So that would be a market. It's still, you know, the natural market for Venezuelan oil is still the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. It's still the backyard of the, the natural market. And many refineries in the Gulf have been configured <coughs> precisely to run that kind of crude. So that would be a, a good thing for, for both sides, I think. Uh, in terms of OPEC, uh, it, it's always tricky to try to forecast the outcome of OPEC meetings. Uh, people get, get it wrong sometimes, <laughs> especially when the, the, the uh, outcome seems to be a foreordained uh, conclusion. <coughs> Uh, but, you know, uh, when uh, Saudi Arabia decided last November not to, not to cut production and not to try to support prices but to maintain production, eventually they actually increased production. Uh, Venezuela was against it. Other OPEC countries lobbied against it. Uh, but then most countries uh, um, just accepted the, the, the decision and tried to increase production. Venezuela <coughs> really... Uh, gain, has nothing to gain from that, has everything to lose from that policy. Uh, and it, it tried to uh, work against it, but it has very few allies left in, in OPEC. Uh, Iran was its, uh, its counterpart, its, its natural ally, the other hawk or super hawk within OPEC. Iran is now uh, you know, post uh, agreement with the US on, on nuclear, or the P5 plus one on the, on the uh, nuclear issues, is preparing it to come back in the market, is, is thinking about ramping up production in a dramatic way, not cutting back production. Saudi Arabia has no, gives no sign that it wants to reconsider its decision. All other countries are, are trying to boost production. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's not likely to be able to, to con convince others to, to cut back. I don't think so. The only important threat in Venezuela in terms of a country is if Canada manages to export significantly more heavy oil into the Gulf Coast. Uh, and since uh, the Keystone Pipeline is, for the time being, out of the, uh, out of the uh, uh, agenda, I think that, that was the most important threat that I saw from the Venezuelans. Do you know something about forthcoming State Department decisions? <laughs> no, 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 no. But it was not imminent at that point, which was uh, last, uh, at the end of 2014. They were, the Venezuelans were very <laughs> worried about that. They, they, can, they can actually identify that that is a huge threat to them. Uh, so that is a, the U.S. energy policy that matters is going to be that one. And some of you will have noticed today a House Energy and Commerce Committee subcommittee approved a bill to lift the restrictions on U.S. oil exports, although there's still a long way to go between that and actually removing that. 
although if you want to understand the issue better, you can read the Navigating the Oil Export <laughs> Debate report on the website of the Center on Global Energy Policy. Next question. Hi, uh, Regina Morales with Veracity Worldwide. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, I wanted to get your opinions on the blending of light and heavy crude oil in Venezuela, um, sort of like a competitive advantage versus the high cost associated with um, the blending. That's one. And then two, um, <coughs> I think from what I understand, you both are pretty optimistic in terms of the upcoming legislative elections as to what will happen. Um, maybe just expand more about, just talk about what you think will happen, what you think is more likely. Um, I know that it's, it, it doesn't really seem that far away, but so many things could happen in between. So I guess talking a little bit more about those little scenarios between now and December. Thank you. I think Francisco is more optimistic than I am about uh, that election. What I think is that it's an extremely important election for the political scenarios going forward. Uh, um, and I, I don't think uh, that even if the opposition doesn't get two thirds, uh, uh, just a simple majority to me has a huge symbolic, uh, uh, symbolic, uh, 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 it's a huge symbolic event because it shows the Venezuelan population that okay, you had to have 30% uh, uh, gap or, or uh, had to have a 30% lead, but it was possible. It's, it's that there was, it's one institution that you can control. So I think it has huge implications uh, that the opposition <coughs> can, can, can win, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, if, if the Chavismo allows uh, uh, the opposition to win that elections. The thing is, is that th this is not, and as, and as Francisco was saying, in any other uh, country, we will not be discussing about the outcome of the elections. It's already clear in the polls what the outcome of the elections should be. What I, what I would say is that the, re the only reason why we're having some doubts uh, uh, and there's some uncertainty is because of the past, uh, uh, um, uh, of, of how the regime of this government has evolved in terms of uh, its, uh, uh, its democratic uh, credentials. And when you have a government that has huge exit costs and that has evolved in one single direction in terms of the democratic credentials, although this is a major thing, I mean, not, uh, not allowing an, ele an election is a, is a major thing. Even if you flirt with other things, elections uh, is a, it's like a no-no, right? It's, it's like the, the last barrier. So it's a, it's, it's a huge decision. But there's an uncertainty because it, it, we don't understand exactly or, or uh, uh, you know, faced with that decision, what, what there is some uncertainty about what the, what the government might do. Uh, uh, so um, but what I would say is that to me it's, it's extremely important the op that, the, the, that the elections take place and that the opposition wins for, more importantly, for the pre, uh, political scenarios ahead because it means that the an, uh, uh, political uh, uh, transition in an institutional way can take place because there are some inst so institutions are responding in a certain way so that you can, for example, move to a recall referendum, you know, if that is the case. There, there, uh, there are certain scenarios that can take place that require institutional response. And so you need that institutional response and, and the elections are gonna give that to you. If that institutional response is not there, then I think the pressures uh, um, on political volatility will build up significantly because then there's no way to, uh, <coughs> to enact, uh, uh, there's no way that the uh, uh, voters in Venezuela can, uh, can make their, their voices heard. So I think it's uh, the election results itself matters a lot for the political scenario that you're seeing, which will matter a lot as well for the uh, oil scenario and for the economic scenarios in Venezuela. So that's why the elections themselves are extremely important. Whether uh, uh, my base case, the base case has to be that the elections will take place and that the opposition should win. But this will not be even a discussion if, we, if it were not for the fact that this is a more difficult uh, uh, political system. So the um, queue is growing and time is running short. So I want to make sure we can get the questions in if possible. So sure. what I'll suggest is that we take the three remaining yeah. questions and then give you a chance to respond sure. collectively uh, to all of them. Oh, on blending, yeah. Um, did you want to say something on that? Well, the blending, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, just a solution convenience. It's a, it's a lower upfront cost. The upgraders cost a lot of money. Uh, the initial investment is huge. Blending is, is less, the margins are less over time, but it, it's, uh, it's much more pragmatic. It's an immediate payoff, so it's a, it's a natural choice. Uh, over time, uh, if the U.S. export 
Venezuela is also a, a natural market for U.S. crude and for U.S. condensate because they could use condensate from the U.S. to blend into the heavy oil. So it's not just the U.S. that's a, a natural market for, for Venezuelan crude. The other way around is true as well. So let's quickly, uh, if I could ask people to be brief and ask questions, and we'll give you a chance to respond to them. Sure. Uh, my name is Ricardo Jaramillo. Uh, I'm also from Venezuela. I'm a freshman uh, in the college. Um, and my question is, uh, what does a sustainable economic policy um, in the future for Venezuela look like? Um, does, that does that include a decrease in social spending? Um, does that include um, a diversification away from oil at some point? Um, and you know, I wanted your thoughts on uh, you know, what that would look like um, in terms of a prosperous future for Venezuela. Uh, next, and we'll, take the, we'll take all the questions, please. Hi, my name is Angel Muñoz, and I am professor of Universidad del Zulia in Venezuela. Um, I'm a climatologist. There is an El Nino right now. Um, electricity in Venezuela is hydro. So have you ever considered, like, it's amazing. All the background that you have given to me, you know, that's not my area of expertise. It's awesome for me. But have you considered what could happen? There is a drought right now. El Nino is there. It's, gonna, it's one of the most intense El Nino in history on record. So no water, drought already there. Before election, this could be a mess. You know, what if, this is a hypothesis, what if the dams have no water and there is no water in the next, I don't know, 20 days? It's not only electricity. I'm also asking you, what do you think is going to happen in terms of people are already like doing long lines to buy food, water. So it's going to be, I think it might be a mess. So have you considered <laughs> that? <laughs> An so. additional mess. Yeah. Yeah, last question. Uh, Nicola Cladedio, also a Venezuelan and an entrepreneur in Venezuela. Uh, so my question, obviously, the f I mean, I think there's two, two important uh, uh, players that uh, haven't been in a discussion, which is the private sector, unrelated to the to the oil industry, uh, and how the how the private sector will be able to survive uh, the dire economic situation. I mean, the shock is pretty massive on the exchange rate, on hyper hyperinflation, and on the politics. And if and if the that the situation is also going to force the government maybe to mediate with the private sector as a solution to staying in power post election. And then the second, uh, I think, very important. Um, influence on what's going to happen post-election and, and prior to elections has been the, the Chinese and the alternative ways of financing. Uh, they've already uh, exhausted a lot of the um, short-term uh, kind of discounting Jamaica and the Petro Caribe countries' loans. Uh, and the only willing actor has been the Chinese in terms of financing and uh, extending a hand uh, to try to keep the government going. But it might also be part of the solution to get rid of the government. <laughs> Uh, when when their when their uh, uh, their investment becomes too risky uh, politically, uh, so so I think uh, uh, in some insight on on what you think the Chinese uh, uh, outlook will be post election, uh, and that's it. Thank you. So let me ask you to each take one minute mm. <laughs> to comment on one or more of those questions. Yeah, well, there are, there are so many. <laughs> let, let me just pick. Uh, uh, I mean, on, on the on the. Uh, idea that I am optimistic on the election, I, I, it's not that I'm optimistic. I mean, I think, uh, I think the, the facts are so strong today that all the previous strategies to sort of, you know, uh, uh, made uh, fraud or, or uh, you know, increase popularity before the elections are not going to uh, be enough this time. And therefore, there could be, you know, a scenario in which there are either no elections, post postponing the elections, or, or open massive fraud. But all of those, I think, will be tremendously costly uh, for the government and will prompt a, a political crisis uh, of major proportions. Uh, in terms of the of the blending strategy, I, I totally agree with what uh, Antoine said. I think if you are you were in the in the in the shoes of uh, uh, the president of PDVSA today, you will do in basically the same thing because of the restrictions to try to do anything else. I mean, it's sort of the only thing that it's relatively easy, and and the cost of I mean, in general, as Risa pointed out. Uh, 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 even in Canada, they are moving uh, to, to, to blending. But in the case of Venezuela, imagine the cost of capital is the highest in the world. So why would you invest uh, in, you know, in a, in a you know, or greater in Venezuela? So uh, and just briefly on the, on the big issues on the future of Venezuela, I mean, Venezuela has tremendous potential on oil. It has to develop it. But of course, you know, uh, at the peak oil price, uh, if you divided all the oil rents of Venezuela in, among the population was $2,000 per person. So 
there is no future for Venezuela if it doesn't have a diversified economy. How to get there, of course, is a, it's a big question that, not for 30 seconds. Luisa. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, the, the Chinese are the uh, most important investors in Venezuela. They are the most important producers in Venezuela. They are the most important providers of all services in Venezuela. They, so, um, so this is a relationship that is there. Uh, um, and whoever is in, in, uh, in, in office will have, uh, um, it's a relationship that, that will continue. And it's a relationship that other countries in Latin America have uh, developed because it's the most important uh, uh, it's one of the most important uh, consumer markets in the world. So it's a relationship that you want to have. Uh, it's just a relationship that might uh, uh, have to be a little bit different. I, I, for a long time, do not believe really that the Chinese are the lenders of last resort. I think that they're, so, they're suppliers of last resort. What they're providing Venezuela is exactly with the, uh, <coughs> with the things that Venezuela is, is uh, with the things that the government is destroying, and that points to the private sector. I think uh, when I see the adjustment that is taking place in, in Latin America in general, it's an adjustment that takes place through the effects. In that adjustment through the effects, we've seen Colombia 50% devaluation, Brazil 60% devaluation in a 12-month horizon. <coughs> it's very costly in economic terms, and it, it's a, it, it comes with a significant decline in imports, but it leads to import substitution, and it leads to more competitive private sector, and eventually leads to exports. That is the way you adjust to a, t a terms of trade, a shock of this magnitude. Venezuela has not done any of that. Uh, it has uh, remained, the fixed exchange rate has remained fixed. You have allowed the parallel market rate to, uh, to depreciate. And if you take that into account, a depreciation of more than 100%, which is the uh, largest in the world, uh, uh, even more than Russia uh, in, the la in the last 12 months. Um, but that depreciation really doesn't, doesn't work uh, because it doesn't allow this uh, FX uh, mechanism to take place and, uh, and the import substitution to take place. So what it has happened is that you are destroying supply and you're destroying domestic supply uh, because of the way you're adjusting. So uh, the macro situation uh, is one of the most important things that you have to fix. Um, and I see in Arge Argentina as well, they have amazing resources, but you have to fix the macro in order to be able to develop your oil resources in, a, in an effective and efficient way. Um, and so what I would say is that you have to start with the macro situation. You have to start with rebuilding the domestic supply that you have, uh, that you <coughs> have destroyed because Venezuela has been behaving like if it was Saudi Arabia importing everything without really the dollar liquidity to be able to do that. And so to me, it's a, it's a, it's a self, it's, it's, it's a, you're in self-destructing mode uh, because the level of uh, uh, destruction of the private sector means that the adjustment that is taking place on the import side it's so ineffective that it's leading to the hyperinflation and scarcity. So I would say that you have many layers of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of change that needs to happen. The first one needs to be the macroeconomic adjustment and then a lot of uh, different reforms in order to, uh, uh, to restore uh, uh, private sector uh, competitiveness and capacity. And uh, we have to, we're over time, so I want to wrap up. But just briefly, I want to make sure one question that was asked doesn't get lost about the climate impacts already being felt, the potential for extreme weather, the potential for drought. Are those issues getting any atten att att attention? Are they perceived as problems? And how do people think about the outlook of being a petrostate in light of those? There's one thing about the, about the electricity issue is that uh, actually Venezuela, in, in line with uh, what uh, Francisco has been saying on its pragmatism, uh, Repsol and any just brought on stream, one of the largest uh, gas uh, uh, reservoirs, uh, 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 La Perla in Venezuela, is one of the largest in Latin America. Um, it is producing right now 150 BCF per day. It is, by the end of the year, it's going to be producing 450 BCF per day. That is more than they were importing from Colombia. So they will have some ability uh, uh, to, uh, to resort to, uh, uh, to gas fire uh, electricity. That's on the electricity front. Uh, they, they do have a, now a little bit more flexibility just because of those natural gas reserves that they burn stream. On the waterfront is where I think the most problematic thing is. Uh, final comment, Antoine? Just a couple of uh, very quick words. Uh, on Chinese uh, role, it's, it's very opaque, very difficult to assess. Oftentimes, announcements of loans in Caracas are not matched by <laughs> corresponding announcements in Beijing. Yeah. There's rumors of dissatisfaction in Beijing with the leadership in Caracas. But the <coughs> relationship is not a dual relationship. It's not just uh, takers and buyers, buyers and sellers. The Chinese are, are now part of a much more complex web of relationships with the country. And for instance, a lot of the Caribbean, petro Carib contracts uh, are now fulfilled by Chinese companies. Chinese companies are supplying the products to Caribbean countries on behalf of Venezuela. So it's a, it's a much more complex but very opaque relationship. Uh, and then in the private sector, 
the, the oil, uh, the industry can be a curse for a country, it has been for Venezuela to a large degree, but it can be a blessing, can be a job, uh, source of job creation. And I think when the oil industry recovers in Venezuela, which it will do at some point, the recovery will have to entail a development of, uh, of associated industries domestically. There has to be a, a well thought out local content dimension to the recovery of the industry and local content itself can be disastrous or can be wonderful. So I think when the policymakers in Venezuela design the right framework for investment, they will have to design the appropriate local content uh, framework as well. Uh, well, uh, as I said, as Antoine said, uh, this uh, study by Professor Minaldi is incredibly timely um, and, and very clear and a lot of great information. I hope people will uh, look on our website and uh, take a look at it. And it's teed up well uh, our next event, which will take a little bit broader lens and look at the new and changing geopolitics of energy with a study that we're releasing by Carlos Pascual, who's a non-resident fellow at the center, the former top energy official of the U.S. State Department. Uh, a conversation we'll have with Carlos and then with Ian Khan, the CEO of Centrica, Michael Levy from the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mona Sutphin, the former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and that'll be Tuesday evening. Hopefully you can join us. If not, you can always uh, watch online, uh, listen to our events on our podcast, through our website, or on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at Columbia U Energy, and I look forward to uh, an exciting and productive new academic year. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.